Hello and welcome back to this damn philatelistic crusade with the iconic Nosferatu turning literally 100 years old this year, which seems crazy to even say. Uh, I thought it was time to at least talk about the two primary releases that I think are both important and really wonderful ways to experience this cinematic classic and really a, a treasure that it's amazing we even have a copy of because, of course, legendarily, uh, it was supposed to be destroyed and every known print was supposed to be destroyed because the film was unauthorized and did not obtain the rights to adapt Bram Stoker's Dracula. So, uh, and this has gone over in the many extras on both discs, that the widow, Florence Stoker, uh, really made it uh, a mission in life to try and suppress this film and, and uh, when there was no money to be made, because the company who made it went bankrupt uh, to at least get it suppressed and then eventually destroyed. But thankfully, copies made it out and survived. And over the years, it was able, it was the, the ability to reconstruct the film and to its original release version with proper titles and proper color tinting and even discovering the original score. And uh, it, it, its reputation really started to grow by the time uh, that the, the sort of sort of copyright infringement furor, I guess, wore off a little bit. And so by the time of the 50s and 60s, when various prints started showing up and then the film was in the public domain and then in the video era, things really took off. So you saw untold amounts of video editions floating around of varying terrible quality from all kinds of different sources. And uh, I still remember the first time I even saw the film, it was just atrocious in terms of the quality uh, that was available. So it's still really a revelation that the film has been uh, restored and, and there are multiple different restorations available and beautiful editions like the two I'm going to be discussing here. Uh, it, it, again, it's it's amazing that the film even exists today because it was supposed to have been destroyed and all known copies were supposed to be eradicated. And ironically, most of F.W. Murnau's uh, early work is unfortunately lost. I think one of the great uh, shames in all of uh, the, the losses of silent films is the fact that so much of Murnau's early work is is just gone. Murnau was one of the great cinematic talents, still is one of the great cinematic talents. Uh, just as I think the loss of his early work is one of the great losses for cinema, I think his untimely death after coming to Hollywood and making uh, Sunrise, which is one of the greatest films ever made and probably my favorite Murnau film, uh, and then winding up uh, his last real film was Taboo. Uh, he died in a car crash, and uh, it really is one of the great losses in all of cinema history, uh, Murnau's untimely death, because there's no telling what he would have done uh, as as the talkie era continued, and uh, once he, you know, what would he have done after sound had fully taken over, and what could he have done, you know, had his career been allowed to progress naturally in the 30s and into the 40s and beyond, perhaps. Uh, Murnau, it's, it's impossible to say enough about his genius and what he contributed to silent cinema. But in talking about Nosferatu in particular, I, I have to admit, it, it is a film that it, it's a little harder for me to get on board with. Uh, it did take several viewings uh, when I first saw it as a kid to, to really get on board with it outside of just the, the creepy atmosphere and the, the use of actual outdoor natural surroundings and not shooting everything on stages and actually getting outdoors with the camera. Uh, I was I was struck most by the the sort of morbid and poetic qualities of the film that I think are really injected by Murnau getting everything out of doors quite a lot, but also uh, really associating the vampire character of Count Orlock with the plague, with death itself. This is a, something that a lot of the critics talk about in the extras, but I think you can pick up on that really the, the, the first time around because Count Orlock is always seen as with actual rats, so giving you the idea that he is sort of a physical manifestation of, of the plague itself. And in Germany, they had just had a terrible, uh, the, the terrible European flu epidemic and, and many, you know, countless thousands and millions died of this. So the, the, this is part of the, the, the theme of the film that a lot of people of the audience of 1922 
would have been very well familiar with. So as with most silent films, you do have to have a bit of context and historical background if you want to get the full impact. You're not necessarily going to get it all uh, on, on the first go round. But I, I think what always struck me as, as a little bit different, it's not quite a Murnau film if you want to use the sort of auteurist theory uh, that unfortunately is bastardized and, and, and overused uh, because you have to take into consideration the other people involved, particularly Alvin Grau, who was really, he's not credited as the producer, but he technically did everything else on the film and had such creative input and actually founded the company that funded the film and then immediately went bankrupt. Uh, so it was really his baby in a lot of ways, if you want to look at it in, in, in more of a modern parlance. And he doesn't have producer credit, but he basically was the film's producer. So he has a lot of input in it. And he was a, a major figure in the occult sciences. So that's something you get to go into and the various extras and hear critics talk about that and what that contributes to the film. So if you look at Murnau's other work and, and you're as big a fan as I am, of Murnau, I think that sort of explains a little bit why Nosferatu feels just quite uh, unique in in what we have of Murnau's surviving films. It's not quite like his other films. It's obviously not quite like Sunrise, but there are elements of, of his other films in there. But again, I think you have to take into account that there is another person's voice in there of, of really Alvin Grau. Uh, so it is a sort of collaboration between the two. So it is, um, as a film, it's different from Murnau's other works, I think. I think it's, it's sort of unique. And it was not a box office success when it came out, and it took time for really the public to, to, to discover it. And of course, that was made all the more difficult because it was an unofficial adaptation of Dracula, and it, all copies were supposed to be destroyed, and then copies would turn up actually retitled Dracula, and with intertitles that actually renamed all the characters back to well, their names in Stoker's novel. Uh, the other important and striking thing about uh, this film that again, when you see it for the first time, may not necessarily sit well with audiences. Uh, if you're very familiar with the story it's in, of, of Stoker's actual novel, which you know, it really has never been done on the screen straightforward. Everything's a take on it. Uh, and Nosferatu's script, it uses a lot, it has a lot of the same structure, but it has to adapt things, and it does so for a German audience of 1922, and it also renames all the characters and tries to pretend like it's not a Dracula adaptation, but it totally is. You know, it, it has the same structure, but it makes a number of changes, and of course it streamlines a very long, rambling novel, but it manages to keep the spirit alive and it actually manages to replicate the actual design of the novel. The novel is famously told almost entirely in documents, whether it be journal entries, diaries, letters, telegrams, uh, and from different viewpoints. So the film actually does have a, a, actually a very large number of inner titles, but most of those, or at least a good portion of them, are actual documents. So you have newspaper clippings, you have letters, you have uh, things that seem to replicate that structure of the novel. So again, I think it manages to keep a lot of the spirit alive. But if you look at it closely, you'll start to kind of recognize things that seem familiar if you've seen, obviously, Universal's Dracula, directed by Todd Browning, which was based on the stage play adaptation of Dracula because Universal didn't have the budget in 1931 to really adapt the novel like Carl Lindley Jr. wanted to as an A feature production. So in a lot of ways, I think Nosferatu uh, actually manages to or managed to influence the, the way that the vampire story, particularly Dracula, was viewed in popular culture. So even though it wasn't successful uh, on any release and it only grew a, a, as a cult classic as people discovered it and got into silent films, it is one of the films that's really a gateway to silent films for a lot of people and uh, because it was the first major Dracula adaptation, even though it was unofficial and it's a horror film that gives it a greater penetration into the public consciousness and you could get any numbers of untold terrible public domain versions on video. Uh, it manages to, I think, sort of set in motion a lot of the ways that the Dracula novel was adapted, particularly starting with the stage play, then getting to the Universal film and then beyond. So it was viewed very much by people in Hollywood. In fact, 
fact, Universal themselves had a copy of it and would run it over and over and over uh, to study it, as a lot of Hollywood studios would do with what were then termed, you know, European art films, but they would also start picking talent from them. Of course, Murnau was famously uh, given a contract at Fox and literally brought over to America and given carte blanche to do all kinds of things, again, resulting in the masterpiece Sunrise. So the, the, it was common for studios to be plucking talent and studying what was coming out of the, uh, the, the real leaders of cinema at the time, particularly in Germany. So, uh, of course, with Nosferatu, they had to do this secretly. And, of course, they bought the film rights from Florence Stoker to make the 1931 film, but they had very closely studied uh, the, the Nosferatu, again, unofficially. They had a print of it, and they would run it over and over and over. So Nosferatu actually influences the 1931 Dracula, which, of course, influences how the world at large viewed Dracula forevermore. So you can feel the echoes of Nosferatu and how it adapts Stoker in the 1931 Todd Browning classic masterpiece. So it's, it's it, Nosferatu's influence can be felt everywhere, uh, just like the forever terrifyingly creepy rat-like clawed fingers of Count Orlock is played by Max Schreck reaches out for you, the audience. Even though it's now reached its centenary and it's 100 years old now, again, it seems crazy to think that, uh, Nosferatu has never quite lost its eeriness, its power to uh, chill the blood, if, if you will, or, or its its haunting quality. And it's it's not about out-and-out out scares. The, the haunting quality, I think, comes from the otherworldliness. And uh, again, some people literally view this film as not necessarily a vampire film, but really as sort of uh, musing on the, the, the flu epidemic that had been a plague across Europe and killed you know millions of people this after happening after the the aftermath and tragedy of world war one so uh, death was on a lot of people's minds and this gets labeled sometimes a german expressionist film which you can consider it in in some ways it has expressionist elements but it also does its own thing it is it is unique as 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 a experience there's nothing quite like this and I'll, and it's i think especially heightened by the fact that Murnau insisted on getting outdoors. Uh, they also didn't have a lot of money. It was a low-budget production. <laughs> so uh, that that also, I think, encouraged everyone to be even more creative. It's a film with a very haunting quality, not just because you're dealing with a vampire character, not just because of linking to the, the tragedies that had befallen the world uh, leading up to its production and release in 1922, not just because it's adapting Dracula, uh, but it's, it's just pervaded with the sense of of death throughout and there's there's a there's a real poetic quality to it particularly uh in in its rendering of of the heroine and how she essentially uh manages to uh, see the danger of count orlock and find a way to deal with it far far um in, in a far deeper and understanding uh, meaning than seemingly anyone else, particularly uh, of the men surrounding her who seemed a bit uh, who seem a bit thick-headed, shall we say, uh, or, or, or a bit of a, dund a bit of dunderheads. Um, but it, it, it's it's that sense of it's not necessarily a sense of doom, although you do get that throughout the film. Uh, but there's there's a haunting, very poetic quality to it that I think that isn't entirely due to Murnau uh, injecting it throughout. There's also a number of really interesting techniques used. Uh, there is uh, really some interesting usage of, of a sort of stop motion effect when Count Orlock is doing uh, bits of business that, again, add to the sense of it feeling otherworldly. Uh, there's also a really interesting usage of negative imagery to make the surroundings seem, again, otherworldly so that that sense of eeriness is always there and it is of course topped off by the absolutely iconic Max Schreck as Count Orlock the design of the Nosferatu character uh, which again was largely due to Alvin Grau so his fingerprints are all over this uh, it, it burns itself into your brain it's an image that never ceases to unnerve people uh, it, it, every you know from his first appearance in the film every single time there is nothing quite like seeing Count Orlock and the sort of rat-like fangs and the bald dead white again sort of 
rat-like head with the rat-like ears and the, the long claws. It is obviously 10 billion miles away from the classic idea of Dracula, which was heavily inspired by a stage musician type uh, of character with the tuxedo or cloak and looking very dapper and having, you know, obviously what was immortalized by the 1931 uh, Todd Browning Universal film with Bela Lugosi. That's the image we all have in our heads of Dracula, but in Nosferatu, you know, it's <laughs> you're getting something entirely different. So it's great to spring on people, or it's it's interesting to always see people's first-time reactions to Nosferatu, because it is very different. Uh, but again, it is interesting to see how much of Stoker they actually got in the film, which, of course, they were not technically allowed to because they didn't get the rights. It was earlier on for copyright law in regards to films, and they didn't have a lot of money, but, you know probably would have been a good idea to at least, you know, <laughs> try to get the rights. And, uh, you know, you might have been able to actually make some money by releasing it properly then. But uh, it, again, it's a fascinating history just looking at the release of the film and the aftermath and that, you know, it took a lot of decades and uh, the film made no money and the company went bankrupt and never made any more films. And Murnau went on to other things. But, you know, by the 50s and 60s, people finally started discovering the film. Uh, others and people interested in film culture and people at studios especially knew how good the film was but you know again it took 30 40 50 60 years for people to finally start uh, recognizing at large the importance of the film and uh, actually getting to see it what really sells the film and what makes it most effective is seeing it in a proper version uh, again the first time i saw it was on a terrible public domain cheapy vhs tape uh, I, I wanted to see it ever since i saw an image of count orlock as a kid in a book i think that's how most people first encountered the film as you see the image of count orlock's face and it's just it, it just stops you cold and you have to see what this is and then i got more and more into silent films and then i finally started seeing some editions of nosferatu that at least had some color tinting and had a score that wasn't atrocious and that made it a little bit better uh you know again it's it was very difficult for a long time uh, people don't really realize how lucky we are to actually have beautiful restorations of silent films now or at least have more options of actual decent or excellent or perfect as perfect as they can be presentations of silent films so I don't, I don't really think it was until late in the Laserdisc and early in the DVD era when you started getting uh, available versions of Nosferatu that were, you know, really at least doing the film some justice. And I didn't get to experience that until uh, really the Kino DVDs started coming out. Uh, I remember the one I had was the, the second one they did, which was pretty good, but I never really liked the electronic score on there, which, again... It's very difficult to enjoy a silent film, even a classic masterpiece of cinema like this is, if you can't really get on board with the score. But at least, you know, the, the, the idea of the tinting was there and we were getting more of the original presentation with the intertitles being recreated properly. Of course, different versions and different restorations of this film approach things differently. Some versions do recreate the titles in as close approximation of the original German release as possible, including the act cards. Others recreate everything in English titles. Uh, you will see that when I talk about these two restorations and releases, they each take the opposite approach. So th there's no real definitive way to restore a silent film. And again, different restorations uh, approach things differently, just as different video labels approach their releases differently. So there are now a variety of different restorations and then upgrades of those restorations for Nosferatu. Uh, there's a number of solid, recommendable video editions. Uh, thankfully, no one has to bother with the plethora of atrocious and terrible public domain editions that exist and seem to still populate stores across the world, uh, or uh, the, the terrible version that are online or get uploaded to YouTube, for example, which are of the same quality, sometimes just literally taken from that, or uh, just because it's free does not mean that it is a good version to watch. And I, to say that I strongly advise anyone who has never seen this film to never look at any of those, uh, it does not even begin to describe. I wish I had been able to look at these restorations and see the film this way the first time, because it definitely would have helped. Because uh, the you know first couple times I saw that saw Nosferatu, it was just 
it was a real struggle because the versions were terrible and the scores were terrible and the, the tinting was either non-existent or really bad or it was from a 16 millimeter copy with you know it just it's a, a, a total mess uh, just like phantom of the opera and any of the other silent classics that most people know uh, that have millions of public domain cheapy releases so now we come to what you have in the two current Blu-rays available that I think are of merit from the two different restorations. Now, uh, these are upgrades of previous restorations. These are the best available and most current restorations of the film available. Uh, we have the uh, the official restoration done by the Murnau Institute, or the F.W. Murnau Siftung, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, I'm, I'm always terrible with pronunciations. So I do apologize. Uh, and then the other, which is actually an, an HD upgrade of the Photoplay Productions restoration, which was originally done in 1996 I believe, or the late 90s, and like the uh, BFI Blu-ray of Phantom of the Opera, the BFI Blu-ray here is actually a brand new 2K scan and upgrade in HD of the Photoplay restoration, so it's bringing that work into the HD realm with a new scan and new presentation. So again, both of these build off of previous restorations, but they're now done to the fullest modern capability. And the only way that I think either one would be superseded would be if, because it's the centenary and there might be an ability to eke a little bit more out of the elements, uh, if somebody was to do a brand new 4K restoration in terms of making sure that we have a 4K UHD release and 4K DCPs for theatrical screenings for the film's 100th anniversary and beyond. So until something like that happens, like of course we're now getting with the cabinet of Dr. Caligari in 4K from Eureka Masters of Cinema this year. It is possible for that to happen with Nosferatu, but it would require new work because I don't think anything has been completed in, in 4K, obviously. But there is the distinct possibility for that, and obviously I think it would be a no-brainer since it is one of the most important and iconic silent films of all time, and it's not like it wouldn't sell copies because it is part of the founding backbone of the horror film genre. So uh, the two restorations and the two Blu-rays you have available are both in the UK. Uh, I will note here in the US, the uh, the Murnau restoration that's on the Masters of Cinema release is available from Kino Lorber, but I, this isn't me, you know, uh, attacking the label or anything. But I must stress: whatever you do, do not buy that disc. Do not watch that disc. And the reason why is silent films were obviously done at differing frame rates. And that wreaks havoc with Blu-ray because for some stupid idiotic reason, when the Blu-ray was developed, they didn't worry about things like that. And so you can't have differing frame rates outside of the normal 24p and 29.97 uh, or 30 frames per second uh, video standard. So you have to do trickery and, and use one of a variety of methods to get a silent film at say 18 frames per second or 20 frames per second or even 16 or 17 frames per second depending on what the actual frame rate is. You have to use different uh, methods to get that encoded on a Blu-ray disc or you know get it encoded for DVD, whatever format it is you have to work with it and encode it in a number of different uh, use use one of a number of methods to actually preserve the original frame rate uh, sometimes well, most of the time it's done by repeating frames uh, like every third frame gets repeated once or things like that uh, different things happen some people prefer keeping a silent film interlaced in the transfer even as an HD release sometimes that's actually more effective than having a progressive silent film release uh, it just depends on the format you're working with, uh, how good the encoding is, what the master is, what the frame rate is. In short, there's a lot of variables, so it's not an easy thing to do to transfer a silent film. Unfortunately, on the Kino release, even though it's using what's on the Masters of Cinema, it's the same master source rest from the restoration, the Kino apparently, what it seems to do is literally drop frames instead of repeating frames or, or, or doing something else. So... I don't know the exact numbers, but somebody discovered with the Kino release, you're, you're losing, you know, roughly about a third of the film because it just drops frames continually. So whatever you do, do not 
pick up the Kino release, you have to get one of the Region B titles I'm talking about. And if you want the official Murnau Institute restoration, you do have to get the Masters of Cinema disc. And it is very inexpensive and really better than the Kino in every way. It's also better encoded. Uh, but the, the big draw is neither of the British import versions I'm going to be discussing here have that major flaw. So when I see people praising the Kino disc, I just start screaming inside because it's like, um, no, it's one of the worst discs ever made. Um, because it literally drops, you know, endless amounts of frames. And that's, you know, kind of a problem when you're looking at a video release or a, or a disc master or something, you know, you, you kind of want the whole film to be there. Um, so yeah, I'm very glad I never picked up that release and I'm very thankful for somebody actually noticing that and, and posting about it. And you can find out information online. I will link to the, uh, some of the technical info below. If, if you're curious, or if you happen to own the Kino disc, uh, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. So uh, whatever you do, just eliminate that from the equation. Uh, don't, you don't, have to pay any attention to that because you can get the Masters of Cinema release instead. So I would strongly advise anyone interested in the film to just go ahead and get the Masters of Cinema release, which is of the Murnau Institute restoration. So it's the same thing that you get on the Kino disc, but it's properly and better encoded. Uh, but the, the big draw is the fact that you're actually getting the entire film and you're not missing giant chunks of the film, which the Kino literally drops. So uh, again, Nothing against Kino, but it was a it's a major snafu and again one of the worst uh, examples of a problematic Blu-ray that there is. Again, I think it's one of the notorious examples of just a poor disc. It is one of the worst Blu-rays ever made, uh, simply in that regard alone. Uh, again, nothing against the label, but it is something that should have been corrected and fixed, and that disc should have been recalled immediately, and no one's ever done anything about it. So avoid that disc, whatever you do. Now, in terms of the British releases, you will need region-free capability. They are both region B locked titles. However, they're both very inexpensive, as I mentioned before, and region-free capability is actually very inexpensive these days. I got my own player. Uh, some players you can get uh, will still work with a sort of remote trick by pressing a certain bu button combination. Uh, you can get modified players. Uh, they, they, they're out there. You do have to do a little bit of research, uh, but it is very much easier to do now uh, with the things being much more available than they were in the DVD era, and there are less region codes to deal with. And you can also get uh, players that will do PAL to NTSC conversions. So if there's a PAL extra on a Blu-ray, for example, uh, you can get a modified player that will convert it so you can actually view it on your television because you can't do that with native PAL material if you're not converting it and you're here in the U.S. and it's not NTSC. So uh, that is something to note, but I think with Nosferatu, there's really no other choice because these two releases are really the only two releases you should be concerned with. Now, the Masters of Cinema is, uh, I think, it, it, this disc in particular is so well done and so important and such an incredible restoration of the film that I do think it is one of the essential Blu-rays of the entire format, I think. Uh, this is one of those select titles, like their release of Caligari that was also done by the Masters of Cinema. I think it, it, this disc is a must-own title for any person interested in the history of cinema and, of course, horror films as well. But it's so beautifully and perfectly done that there is... There is nothing wrong with it. I have no quibbles, no qualms whatsoever, uh, save a personal one, which I'll get to when I talk about the BFI release. So the Masters of Cinema release did have originally a fancier special edition steelbook that sold out very quickly, uh, but it has the same art as this. So here we have the beautiful original poster artwork here done in the typical Masters of Cinema style with their clear, sort of thicker UK style case. I really love what MOC or Eureka or whichever company name you want to use. I love the Masters of Cinema line. I love everything that they do. You get the lovely spine. All of these have their custom spine numbers. Then you have the rear with the lovely description and the extras and the technical specs. Again, this is Region B locks, so you will need the ability to play Region B titles. We get to the interior. The disc art carries over the poster artwork. 
And then the booklet is a really substantial one. This is a nice, hefty book with the original artwork on the front. This actually clocks in at, let me see the page count. Uh, it's, you know, it's over 50 pages long. Uh, the essays are really well done. Uh, we get all kinds of historical background and then notes on the restoration of the film and the technical presentation specs. Uh, it is loaded with stills throughout. The paper stock has a nice glossy feel to it. It has a premium sort of feel. Uh, the text is very readable. And, you know, even though it's on the smaller side, uh, it is still very legible, very easy to read, and this really is done you know, as a reference work. Got a lovely shot of Murnau there. Again, they always get nice uh, publicity and set stills to include the booklet where possible. And then I always love Eureka putting in the technical notes and making sure that people are actually watching these in the correct aspect ratio and giving pictorial examples of what a stretched or cropped image looks like. And then also... They're one of the only people I've ever seen actually talk about uh, turning off motion smoothing settings on your television. That's something that is very important that unfortunately most people are not aware of or don't, uh, unfortunately don't deactivate on their televisions. And it is very important when you're trying to get silent films at the correct frame rate and getting them in the HD realm to not have them move incorrectly. So that is a, a nice thing I've always appreciated that they do on all their releases. And then we have lovely interior art underneath the disc and booklet. And then they always put the chapter listing there. So you can always have a nice, easy reference to the chapters. So this, again, comes from the official Murnau Institute or Murnau Siftung uh, restoration of the film. This is in its full, complete version. All of the title cards are meticulously recreated to uh, mimic and approximate the original German release version at, and as, much as, as much as humanly possible. And they, of course, are in the original German text uh, with English subtitles. It also includes the original German act cards. When you look at this restoration, you will note the film literally is broken up into multiple acts. So you get the actual title cards for end of act one, start of act two. This was in the German original release and is not present in most versions, and it is not present in the BFI disc of the Photoplay restoration. So not every version has these. So this is another uh, example of this restoration trying to fully recreate the original German theatrical release version, uh, which no other previous restorations have been able to do as accurately up to this point. So that's another thing exclusive to this release. Also, the color tinting here is very much trying to approximate the original release as well. Uh, that is done with the uh, most research possible of original materials that survive. Not every silent film had actual tinting notes. Uh, some directors would actually involve themselves in it. Uh, thankfully for some silent films, tinting notes actually survive, so you have actual first-hand reference materials on how the tinting is supposed to be done. Uh, with Nosferatu, it seems relatively straightforward that the night scenes would obviously, obviously be done a dark blue to actually indicate night, as most silent films would be. Um, blue is most of what you'll see in the tinting on this release and most of the official versions for the night sequences and any scene supposed to be taking place at dawn. Uh, in darkness. Similarly, for, for daylight in this and most official versions, you're going to find the tinting runs to be more of a golden or amber tint to suggest sunrise or during the day. So that's th those are the predominant tints you'll see in this release in terms of the official restoration. So it's blues and sometimes a shade of more greenish blue or an aqua. And then for the day scenes, it's mostly a gold or amber or or version of a yellow type tint and it really enhances the impact of the film to see a properly tinted version like this uh, again most of the modern official releases if they're not using this restoration they do follow suit uh, with this sort of tinting approach and this is what you saw on the uh, restorations that appeared on dvd the photoplay restoration tinting is relatively the same but it does uh, make a number of departures here and there. Uh, it uses quite a bit more of uh, a pink tint for dusk, for example, uh, 
Uh, so it, it makes its own choices. No two silent film restorations are going to be the same in their tinting choices for the most part, unless there's official documentation to go off of or somehow original prints that survive and are somehow viewable. Uh, but for, for the most part, the tinting between the two restorations is pretty much on the same page. Uh, it is the way you want to see this film. When you see it in black and white, it does lose something, particularly all the night sequences because they are shot day for night. Uh, they're just, you know, obviously broad daylight and it, it looks very weird when you see this film in one of the multitudes of terrible older public domain transfers where there's no tinting and the print source isn't very good. So the tinting does absolutely help. Now, in terms of the audio, this is actually a newer re-recording of the film's original score. It is presented in lossless stereo and lossless 5.1 DTS HDMA codec. Uh, it is a beautiful score. It, it perfectly suits the film, and thank goodness that we finally have a modern restoration that actually has a great score. Uh, the fidelity is really wonderful. Uh, in terms of the difference between the stereo and surround presentations, I have to admit that uh, for the most part, for silent films, I do always tend to prefer the stereo presentation. Usually when they do 5.1 up mixes of, because most of these scores are actually recorded in stereo, uh, most of these tracks are going to be 5.1 up mixes. But a lot of times what I've found is that the 5.1 version of a silent score it spreads the sound out a bit, which is nice and better better for home theaters or actual theater halls to really spread the sound around. But you do lose some of the clarity of what you get in the stereo in terms of the instrumentation. And the, the, the overall impact of this track is already such that I don't really think you need the 5.1 bump. Uh, if you have a home theater set up, you can A and B between the two. You can just toggle them with your remote. And I think you'll notice the difference, particularly on higher end equipment. And especially if you have really good main speakers that I do think the stereo is actually a little bit clearer. And again, that's usually what I find the case to be in silent presentations. Plus, I just I've never really enjoyed a silent film with a surround track because, again, most scores are recorded in stereo and most of these scores are usually older recordings and they're having to be up mixed. And I do think they usually lose a little bit of clarity in uh, have, being able to spread the sound around. But it may be on your setup that the 5.1 works better for you. I just encourage people to actually uh, just check but to toggle between the two uh, to see if it makes much of a difference on your end in your own personal setup but the score is the same and sounds excellent both ways i just prefer the stereo presentation now and on to the extras which is really a fantastic package so we have two audio commentaries for this release the first is by david callett this is a jam-packed really energetic commentary he goes into every single facet of the film's production also the release history the battles with florence Stoker to get the film suppressed and eventually destroyed, how it sort of came back to life like a vampire. Uh, it talks about Murnau and Grau, especially, and Grau's importance to the film that's been so frequently overlooked. Uh, the actual real world uh, production schedule, the fact that it was a low budget film. There is not one facet of this that does of uh, this film that isn't covered in this commentary track. It is done with a really good pace to it, but it's never, you know, breathless or anything but there's there's never uh you know a uh, dead space or dead air it is one of the best critical informative historical commentaries i have ever heard for a film it is a it's in that special like you know legendary tier of commentary uh it's an absolute essential listen and it's so good that all of the other materials because they go over a lot of the same same bits they, they kind of get overshadowed by this commentary because it is so jam-packed with information. So it is a must-listen commentary. It is the best extra of all the Nosferatu extras, uh, even though all the other extras are good. Uh, this is why you get this disc. This commentary is that good. It is a must-listen for all cinephiles, all fans of this film, and all who want to know more about the making of Nosferatu and about Murnau and about the German cinema. It is a an incredible commentary track. It's the type of commentary track you listen to because it's 
film school in a commentary track. It's one of those. It's one of those really special ones. And it's all done in a manner that's very easy to understand and actually keeps you engaged. And you can listen to it and actually listen to it, not even be watching the film, just listen to the commentary track. It is that good and that essential. So it's kind of good in a way that we have a secondary commentary, even though it definitely gets overshadowed by the first. The second commentary is a more conversational one between historians and critics R. Dixon Smith and Brad Stevens. And they basically have a dialogue during the film. They cover some of the same information obviously because it's the same film but it sort of helps you unpack some of the the just a massive amount of details that was in the first commentary track so when you listen to the first track it's very helpful to actually listen to then immediately go into the second track because it helps you unpack some of the stuff and they also uh, will directly reference the film and you get that sort of nice conversational dialogue between the two so I do actually find uh, the second commentary track is also rewarding but you know it definitely gets overshadowed by the first one's sheer volume of information and if that wasn't enough we get an entire nearly hour-long documentary entitled The Language of Shadow which is about uh, Murnau's early years and Nosferatu's production. So again, some of the same material gets covered, but again, it's it's a whole nearly hour-long documentary and is well, well worth your time. Uh, so again, the, it, the, that already just adds to the uh, very extensive supplemental coverage. Then there's also a new interview with the author of the BFI Film Classics book on Nosferatu, Kevin Jackson. He covers, again, some of the same material, but it's it's a really nice piece and a nice one-on-one -on -one interview that's pretty lengthy. Uh, then uh, there's a little uh, video bit by Abel Ferrara, of all people actually talking about the film, which was uh, a big influence on him, but it was nice of him to do that and it's a one of those nice little okay here's this you know famous director talking about this film for a couple minutes uh so that's there as well and then it goes on to credit uh the newly translated english subtitles with the original german intertitles and then the 56 page booklet that i already mentioned so that is the package for nosferatu in the masters of cinema edition I really do think this is one of the essential Blu-rays for any collection. Uh, it is absolutely perfect in every way. So that means, of course, why am I going to now talk about the BFI disc and try to encourage you to look at that as well? Uh, since this is already, I think, pretty much perfect. Uh, it is missing one thing that's in the photoplay version that I, I really enjoy, and the photoplay version has some really great strengths of its own. So the photoplay restoration was originally done a number of years ago, and then like the BFI disc of The Phantom of the Opera, this BFI Blu-ray presentation is a brand new 2K scan of elements, and then they recreated their original restoration, and then we could get this lovely Blu-ray presentation. So this does have different uh, a different approach than the uh, Murnau Institute version on the Masters of Cinema release. This does have uh, a color tinting approach of its own. It is largely very similar, but different in ways. It's also a different print element that's being used. So I think I think this one kind of gives you more of the effect of not necessarily a warts and all approach, but you kind of get more of that feeling. So it is it is a little rougher. It's not as, shall we say, technically pristine as the other restoration. But in some ways, I kind of like it a little more because it does give you a, a little bit more of a, a gritty feel, I guess, if you will. And this is only when you're comparing them directly. This is still a fully restored uh, presentation, don't get me wrong, uh, but it definitely, I think, gives you a little bit, uh, a little bit more of the feeling of the the wear of age and time. Uh, it does, as I alluded to before, it doesn't recreate the German titles. It actually it uses English titles, but it does recreate the bits of newspaper and things, and it really tries to continue the effects the film intended, but it is not in German for all the title cards. All the title cards are in English, so um, I'm still kind of torn which which I prefer. I kind of lean towards still having the original German with subtitles, but you know it does make it easier seeing it not having to read subtitles but um, it's still a great presentation but again I I still kind of lean more towards how the uh, the other restoration keeps the original German text um, but that's that's the the main 
main technical difference between the two. This is a different restoration with different approaches, but it's largely achieving the same goals. Again, this is also a 2K scan. It's a modern HD restoration presentation, just updating the original photo play work. So it is still a perfectly valid and proper way to see the film. Now, the other reason why this is important and why I wanted to get this and why I love this release the score here is presented in Lossus Stereo and 5.1, but the score was composed by the legendary James Bernard, most famous for his iconic Hammer scores, and most especially his Dracula theme from Horror of Dracula. So the idea of having James Bernard score Nosferatu just seems perfect, and it is. Um, ironically, it actually seems to follow quite a number of the beats of the original score. So when you compare the Bernard score to what's on the MOC disc, uh, a lot of the beats are similar because, you know, when it's a scene in a silent film, there's only you know certain ways you can really score that. But Bernard talked about how he felt it was really a challenge to do and to give it his own style, but also serve the film and not make it sound like one of his Hammer scores throughout. There are flourishes for all Hammer fans of his scores. Uh, there are definitely James Bernard flourishes and moments throughout. But the instant this score starts, where the original, the MOC score you know, has moments of levity and it has moments where there really isn't much score at all in a few pieces. Uh, this score grabs you by the throat from, from the moment it starts and it never lets up. It still has moments of levity. It suits the film perfectly. And while the, the score on the MOC disc is maybe, you know, technically more accurate because it's based on the original score, this one just gives you that, that, you know, that sense of relish. And it, when it goes for the darkness, it really goes there. So, uh, my one big qualm with the MOC disc is that it doesn't have the wonderful, incredible, beautiful James Bernard score that is on the photoplay restoration that is I think the biggest reason why it's important to have the BFI disc because it's a beautiful incredible score and again it's just more ballsy and it grabs you by the throat and it never lets up so that is the biggest draw and most important reason to also have the BFI release of the photoplay version even if, like me, you, you'll prefer the more technically, historically accurate uh, German titles of the MOC disc, and, you know, it, it seems, you know, a bit more polished because it was, you know, by the Murnau Institute, things like that. There are interesting bits and things to recommend in the BFI version, and I like having both restorations. It's one of those where you really have two great restorations of a silent film. They just approach it a little bit differently. But the James Bernard score is really the reason why you want to get this. It is presented in stereo and losses 5.1. Again, I do prefer the stereo, but here the 5.1 mix doesn't dull anything. It actually spreads the score around nicely, but it also seems a bit unchecked because... There's a lot of really nice deep bass moments in his score, and in the 5.1 up mix, it really just throws it all into your subwoofer, so you're just getting a lot of deep rumbles, which, I mean, you get a lot of that deepness in the stereo, but it's not, you know, big distracting rumbles. So uh, the 5.1 mix is fun. You know, it, it's very good, and it's, it's a fun mix, but it's not as shall we say, composed as the stereo, which it was a stereo recording, and I like to keep things in their original format. So I do uh, also favor the stereo here, but at least the 5.1 is nice and big in terms of its sound, but it is, you know, a bit rumbly and, and things like that. Um, so I do still side with the stereo. Now, in terms of the packaging, you get lovely, again, the lovely original art that helps distinguish it from the MOC disc. Then the rear... It's rather simple, but, you know, very nice with imagery, and it's easy to read. Then the interior, we get the film's most iconic shot, uh, colorized a little bit, and it looks really nice on the disc label. But we also get a rather nice and rather stuffed booklet. This one's actually a little bit bigger, so it fits in the case, but... It's just as well done. Nice, very glossy paper, lovely images. We get this lovely essay as well going into a lot of the same detail, but, you know, it's it's so well written that, you know, I actually enjoy reading both booklets uh, when I revisit the film. And then it also, you know, talks about the special features and the presentation, lovely imagery, of course. And most appropriate is this actually has 
a little piece by James Bernard about how he approached the score, and then a little bit of biographical background on Bernard. And underneath, we get advertising for other BFI titles. Now, in terms of the extras, some of these will cover the same ground, but the main one is a an older piece where you have Sir Christopher Frayling talking about Nosferatu, and because he's Sir Christopher Frayling and he's always fascinating, <laughs> even though he's going over the, the same material you'll find covered in the MOC disc, it's still a really nice piece. It's about 25 minutes long, and of course he starts going to town and we're all just sitting there fascinating as, uh, fascinated as always. So that's a really nice piece, even though, again, it's going over a lot of the same information uh, but it's it's a really nice uh, interview then interestingly the uh, the, the other two main pieces are uh, HD transfers or restorations of two short films one is 1945's Le Vampire uh, which runs nine minutes and it's uh, basically as the ed- as the extras credit uh, it's a study of the South American vampire bat uses an allegory for Nazism which was then of course sweeping through Europe the other is the 1904 short the mistletoe bow uh, from uh, running eight minutes which is uh, the uh, credited as the oldest version of a cl- of a Christmas ghost story uh, restored by the BFI with a new score uh, those are really interesting inclusions uh, they're not necessarily 100% linked to the film but they do have you know, obviously a link with vampirism in one and then the sort of otherworldliness of the other. And they are in HD and they are cleaned up and restored. So any sort of excuse to have vintage material that would otherwise not be seen is really welcome. So that's a really nice exclusive touch that they didn't have to do in this release. Uh, Then there's a really nice image gallery of uh, production stills and uh, pre-production imagery and design and artwork, which is really nice. Uh, and then, of course, we get the the full booklet that I already went over. So that is the BFI release. And again, it stands on its own, even though the MOC disc is already excellent. So of these two releases, which do I think you need? And uh, you, I mean... To be quite honest, the MOC disc is a must. It is one of, I think, the best Blu-rays ever made. But the Photoplay restoration has really nice, interesting, exclusive pieces. But most of all, the James Bernard score is absolutely wonderful. And I wish it was with the the restoration on the MOC disc with the German intertitles. I think it would be fascinating to see this with the James Bernard score. But it was composed for the Photoplay version, which runs slightly different because... Different restorations have different run times, so uh, I hope one day uh, there could be a version of this restoration from the Renau Institute with the Photoplay James Bernard score. But as it is, I think both presentations are excellent. I think uh, both in picture and sound, both are really the only two ways you should experience Nosferatu. And I think in terms of the extras, there are some nice pieces on the BFI disc that actually complement what's on the MOC disc. So really, I think it's good to have both. They're also very inexpensive. They're they're usually about 15 pounds when you're looking at them on UK retailers, but they're frequently on sale for closer to 10 pounds, and sometimes the BFI disc is less than that. I picked this up a number of years ago from, uh, I believe it was Amazon UK, and it was only like four or five pounds, and of course, that's still very cheap even when you do the currency conversion. So this one frequently goes on sale for even less than the MOC disc. I think either one is a perfect way to experience the film, but if you were to just have one, it has to be the MOC disc uh, because it is the definitive archival presentation as it stands, I think, and the uh, the extras are really phenomenal, particularly the audio commentary by uh, David Callett. It is a must-listen track, one of the great commentaries in all of commentaries, I would argue. But the BFI is also excellent. So if you just have the BFI release or this is the version you pick up, it's still an excellent way to view the film. And the James Bernard score is really phenomenal. And I do actually prefer it to the the score on the MOC simply because it really grabs you by the throat and never lets go. Uh, But I love both scores. And thankfully, there are now finally two great presentations of this immortal work that can start to wipe away all my years of memories of terrible copies that I saw growing up. Uh, So we do have two great presentations that are both admirable, and uh, I think these are what you should view the film with. 
do not go with any other release. There is no other release that comes close or even approaches either of these, and do not go with the U.S. Kino release. So I, while I, it is something you will have to be able to have the ability to play either disc because they are both Region B, I do think this is one of the uh, perfect examples of why you do go Region Free here in Region A. Uh, these are both very affordable, essential versions of one of the great classic iconic films and really the only versions you should be considering or viewing these are really uh, where Nosferatu is able to live once again so that is the MOC uh, edition of Nosferatu and the BFI edition of Nosferatu both from region B both absolutely worth your time and as it stands in 2022 for the film's 100th anniversary these are the definitive presentations of the film as it stands today at the, at the again the birthday of the film so i think now is perhaps the perfect time with it also being october to perhaps once again visit our old friend count orlock and his very 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 extraordinarily creepy castle and wonder why any stray traveler would wander in except with the entire idea to once again be swept away and mesmerized in a symphony of horror that is Nosferatu. So that's my review of both uh, Region B presentations of the classic masterwork Nosferatu. Uh, I think these are definitely the way to go. I don't think any, there is any other release to even consider. Uh, and this is definitely an example where you really need to be region free in order to actually enjoy the best versions of a classic masterwork available. Uh, there is no equivalent release here in the U.S. that is even advisable. Again, the, the Kino is technically flawed and should be avoided. Uh, so I, I do think both releases are important, and they're both very inexpensive, so I do recommend having both uh, when you can get them, uh, you know, depending on how you import titles. So uh, as, as usual, I hope this has been fun and at least somewhat informative to once again hear me babble on about classic film masterworks. And as always, keep supporting studios and in incredibly important film preservation work by buying titles on physical media to show that you support this incredible preservation of our cinematic heritage and culture and keep your disc spinning to help keep physical media alive and thanks ever so much for watching